Hello, today is September 30th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and today we are privileged to have with us Mary Ellen Ames. Welcome, Mary Ellen. Well, Thank you for here. coming. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Milton, Massachusetts on November 11th, 1918. And it was the day the armistice was signed. And when I came to, my mother, or when my mother came to, she thought my father was a doctor. And she said to him, is this celebration and noise all about Mary Ellen? And he said, no, it isn't. He said, the peace has just been signed and they're all on the street yelling to hell with the Kaiser. So I was very lucky not to be called Peace. I went through life with a double name, but at least it was not Peace. It was Mary Ellen. And where are you currently living, Mary Ellen? I'm living in, in Street, South Ellen. Natick or Natick. And, and how long have you lived there? Since 1954, which makes that about 54 years. And your marital status? Well, I'm a widow. And do you have children? Three. And any grandchildren? Four. Three sons and four grandsons, no girls. Three brothers, no girls, no sisters. So it was just you. Just me, yes. <laughs> now, you didn't enter the military, but tell us how you got involved in World War II. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Starting in college, you, did you graduate in the Milton school system? No, or? no I, I, went, I lived in Wollaston, Massachusetts, so I just went to Milton to be born. And so I went through the public schools in, in uh, Quincy, and I mean Wollaston, and then Quincy. And then as a, as a junior, I transferred to Thayer Academy. And I graduated from Thayer Academy in 1936 and went on to Wellesley College and graduated from there in 1940. Um, shortly after I graduated, I took a secretarial course and was prepared to do something in medicine. I had wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't have the money to go on, nor the background to do it, nor the interest in chemistry, etc. So at that point, um, I went in, into secretarial work and was working as a secretary for a, I went into medicine anyway, for an oral surgeon. And um, then we went to war, the United States went to war, and uh, the president, our president, who was Mildred McAfee, and later became Mildred McAfee Horton. At Wellesley was, College. Yes, was asked to be the president of Wellesley College, was asked to be the head of the waves. So of course all loyal Wellesley women who were old enough to go into the, I mean graduated and who were not married and had no other attachments, decided the thing to do was to go to join the waves. I couldn't get in because of my eyesight was not 20-20. I didn't want to go to the wax. I wanted to go overseas. I wanted to be with a hospital if possible. And not. And so I joined the Red Cross, not the club mobile and not the aspect that served donuts and, and had entertaining groups around Europe, but uh, with a general hospital. So I was assigned, assigned to the first general. What do you mean first general? Well, the first general, but what, first of all, we went to to Washington, D.C. in July of 1943. And uh, I was trained there for two weeks in the university, taking courses about what we would experience in, in Europe. And then we were had an internship in St. Elizabeth's Hospital in, to, in, in, in Washington, in D.C. to give us some idea of how to deal with patients, in case we hadn't had that, since none of us had had nurses training. I was neither a social worker nor a recreation head had experience with the recreation for groups. But I had secretarial training, so I became the secretary for the unit, which meant doing everything anybody else didn't want to do, practically, but also really took charge of all getting all the soldiers, back, their back payments, dealing with them constantly when they wanted to write letters, dealing, making the records, and so forth. So that so was what I So would these have been soldiers who were in hospital, or? They, if this had been what? Soldiers who were in the hospital or soldiers? Just... Well, this was to train us for later when we went for into the first general. Now, the first general was a large general hospital. It had 
500 enlisted men, 55 nurses, 55 doctors, and 100 nurses, and a unit of five Red Cross workers, two social workers, two recreation, and a secretary. And we were assigned to keep up the morale of the patients, to do all of the, they, outside of all of the medical work done by the nurses and doctors, we did everything else. We kept up their morale. We, we had parties for the bed patients and the walking patients. We wrote letters home. We did everything we could for them, plus the enlisted men, because nobody paid much attention to the enlisted men and their interests in doing something that was interesting. So we ran dances for them in England and France, and we did all we could to help now, them. Now, before you talk about England and France, you were in D.C. That's learning right. how That's to right. do this. So how long were you in D.C.? All, all together, just the, just the two, let's see, just the four weeks. So you did a training for four weeks. That's right. And then did you know you were going to be shipped over to see No, then we, then we went to Fort Meade. And we still, and then that was when I was, our unit, I was put together in a unit, and we all met for the first time at Fort Meade. And we joined the first general hospital, who was also there being trained. And we had further training, and this was in the kinds of things that could happen to us. We, we dug, all of us, the women had to march as, long, as many miles as the men. Any woman, any nurse who was going there, we didn't know whether we were going to Africa, or whether we were going to England, or what we were going to do, because the first general didn't know yet. And so we had then, we trained there from August until, well, we finally didn't leave there until we went to Miles Standish, where we were going to leave for overseas. Now, when you mentioned training, you mentioned marching. And I know prior to this interview, you mentioned digging trenches. Did you learn to do that? Oh, yes, we did. Training? We did. We, we absolutely. We all of us built, we went on bivouacs out in tents and living off and cooking our own in case we got caught in that situation. We did foxholes. We packed and unpacked our equipment in the neatest possible way so that we could manage. We marched, and the women were allowed to march if we wanted to. Now, we didn't all want to, but I loved marching because it was great. And we had a Negro or colored troops, as they called them, and I was constantly watching them because they were just like magic there. They were able to do with counting numbers, one, two, three, four, just, just, it was just magic. So I enjoyed very much going out and marching with them. And so then we had been at Fort Meade and we went to Camp Pickett where we had further training where it was much more primitive there. Now when you had all of this training, what did you wear? Well, we wore a <laughs> helmet. Well, we wore, it depended. We wore fatigues just like the men. We had, on, uh, you know, quite heavy fatigues. We were issued steel helmet. Hel Plastic helmets and steel helmets. We were list, uh, We were we were equipped with uh, belts, web belts, so that we could carry a first aid material and sort of thing on that. So we had everything that we needed to have except for the guns. I mean, we had the same sort of heavy shoes, all kinds of equipment of that sort. And so uh, at that point, we then the most interesting. <laughs> was the infiltration course, which up to that time, they had not involved any women in that action, which was supposed to be the final training for the enlisted men and how to crawl across the field in which they were being shot at all the time. And so we had to do that too. And we were addressed in the same kind with the helmets. And we crawled across this field where there was barbed wire and there were rocks and there was just very difficult and we caught crawled on our stomach, and it seemed like a tremendous length. It was pretty long. But, of course, the men shooting the live ammunition, we knew that we wouldn't get hit. We couldn't believe they were going to kill us off. So we, so we, but it wasn't, it was kind of scary because you didn't know. And they would, of course, love to have women doing this. This was just wonderful. So they would yell things like, keep your butts down. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we finally got through that anyway. So that was, that was what we did then. And then we were alerted that we were going to be assigned. And we had been assigned. And so we learned through the grapevine that we were supposed to go to Africa. Well, at that point, the ship had problems with repairs. So fortunately for us, in my mind, they changed. And so we had to wait another four or five weeks at Camp Miles Standish in Massachusetts, outside of Plymouth. 
and we were assigned then to the European theater. And we still didn't know where, but I mean, I didn't know where we... And what time of year, when was this? What year was this? This was 1943. 1943. And it went on from, from July, when I first had my, started my training, to October, when we were uh, sent up to, uh, well, actually, we went through Thanksgiving in Miles Standish, and we're not supposed to get in touch with anybody we know, know or tell them where we were going. And then, it, and finally, in, um, on the 18th of November, we went from, no, let's, no, wait a minute, that was not then. But it was in, after Thanksgiving, early in December, through, well, it was actually, we were on the water in December. So and you were being shipped over from Camp Miles Standish to the European Theater? That's right. That's by right. boat. Oh, yes, by a huge had, ship. Had you ever been on a ship that size before? No, I hadn't. No, How I hadn't. did you react to that? Well, it was interesting because, uh, well, our, our quarters were reasonably decent, but we had a, other, other hospitals and units on, so it was very crowded. But the life, it was 10 days. We were accompanied by the battleship Texas, which was supposed to protect us from submarines. And, and do you did, remember the name of the ship you were on? Yes, we were on the, shoo, 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 what were we on? Oh, my, I should remember, shouldn't I? I can't think of that right now. I do know that uh, the tech battleship Texas was with us as a protection, and the other boats and ships were with us too in a large flotilla because they thought we had more protection that way. So then we landed in Liverpool uh, on January 8th. So when you're on this ship, were soldiers also going over with you at the same time? Oh yes, the whole unit, absolutely the whole hospital of 500 655 people with, with for the Red Cross, and other people from other units, too, were on it, too. And so, did you, were you segregated from the men while on the ship? No, 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 no. And we had, on New Year's Eve, we had a dance, which was unbelievably funny, because the, the large ship, as large as it was, was sort of in rough seas, and so we would be dancing, and then we would all slide down to the end of the other end in a in a tumble and to finally get up and get very funny about the whole thing. So we played cards, we played cards with the men and the officers. We did we didn't see the enlisted men. They didn't they the nurses and officers could fraternize. What them. were you hearing at that time about the war? Well we were very uncertain. I had a brother who had gone over and we had a word from him and he had gone into the fighting and we knew that he was in Europe and that had fought into France and and was being, had been wounded at one point and so forth. So, and my father died when I was a freshman and my mother just had the two of us and she really didn't, well, she forgave me, but she was not very happy that I had enlisted because I didn't need to. And she thought I should stay at home and be with her. Now, but, when you went over and, and you mentioned earlier in the interview about duty as a Wellesley girl to do this, did other uh, friends of yours? Oh yes, go I had many. Time? I had many in the Red Cross, many in the waves, many of them. That's what I envied because in a way, but on the long run I much preferred what I did because they never got out of the United States and they did office duty all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I, we'd all admired uh, our president so much and we were proud of her and we also wanted to do our, you know, our duty as well. So, so when you arrived in Liverpool, what time, this was in December of 43? This was, no, we arrived in, in Liverpool on January 8th, January. 1944. And what happened when you arrived? Well, we marched through the city. It was our first glimpse of, of devastation at all. And so we'd expected it from newsreels and pictures and when we'd been home. But it began to make us realize what we were really going into. Up to that time, it had all been play, you know, games. What, what do you remember the most about the devastation? Well, as we went along, we arrived and we traveled all night, so it was hard to, but we constantly kept looking out and trying to find out how much. We didn't see as much that day as after we'd gotten established in North Mims and went into London and saw quite a bit in London. And uh, so that we were, we rode through the night, all of us wondering where we were going, and suddenly beginning to realize of when we'd ever get home again. That was our first, right? So, Meaning you were concerned about your safety? Sure. I mean, we didn't know what we were getting into. And they While had told, you were 
going into London, was there bombing going on? We didn't see anything that night at all because we went from Liverpool to, to north west of London in a little town called North Mims, which already had a general hospital established. And we were taking over and they were being moved to another place. So that was what, we were still pretty naive about what would happen. We had never functioned as a total unit. We'd all been, you know, at play, being a, at a hospital. So when we arrived in North Mims, it was already complete, and they, the hospital was complete with patients and the whole thing, and they just moved on out, and then we had to establish ourselves in there. that hospital. Yes, in that hospital. And that's when we began to realize, you know, what we had to do and how much we had to do. But it was then that we began to, through January, February, and March, we had tremendous amount of, of, of buzz, buzz, you know, there were two different kinds of buzz, uh, the bombs. There were the buzz bombs and the doodle bugs. And the first, the first kind of a bomb, uh, we, it would cut off. Um, so you would, if you heard it going over as we did, then you'd feel a little safer when you were in bed at night because the fact that it cut off and then it drifted. So you know if you heard it cut off above you, the next, the next type of bomb, which was called a doodle bug, did not, it was silent and it could land anywhere. And that's the kind that hit us in July. In a, but they hit us during the daytime. But at night, we could hear the flak dropping on the roof of our hut. And so you really knew that they were, and the noise was pretty terrific. So and uh, that along with on, establishing this hospital, you lived in huts? Were well, like we lived. I'll tell you what huts? we had. We had 53, uh, we had 53, Quonset huts are the long type, as you know, and the Nissen huts are square and more of, I mean, little a smaller rectangle kind of a hut that housed four people, on, eight people, four beds on each side and a coal stove in the middle. That was, we had no other heating. And our job at night among uh, each of us, uh, we lived with a physical therapist, a five unit Red Cross and a physical therapist and two other nurses. And the, the, we had to go, we rotated who took care of the fire at night because you had to be very clever about laying the fire at night that would be able to be still smolder enough to start it up quickly in the morning. Very smoky, very cold, grimy, grimy stuff. And so you had to be clever about that or you certainly, your, your roommates were not happy with it. We had an ablution hut all the way down. We lived the farthest away where you could have your showers and your uh, get down every morning and go up every night to wash your teeth and so forth, brush your teeth. So then the, the main concert huts were 20 were assigned to the surgical and 20 to the medical ward. So they had those separated. And then the other buildings were, were administrative with nurses and officers and enlisted men. And then the, and then the Nissen where the Nissen, where are all of our huts, I mean all of our, where we lived. So that we had separate sessions, and it was quite a big hospital, and it was built on Lady Burns' estate. Now, Lady Burns had a huge estate, and she had given it to the American, let them, and went back to her, of course, afterwards. And they had constructed this big hospital, and it was very, very pleasant to be on this state where you had cows and sheep and things that were on the sides. And uh, there was a chapel, a delightful chapel. There was a little tea house down the road that was there and catered to us because they would have an egg and a tomato once in a while when we, of course, didn't have anything like that. We had very ordinary kind of sea ration, stew and a potato and not, not ever any fruit. Once in a while we get some And what fruit. type of injuries were you seeing that were brought Mostly, well, they were came, they were came, anybody had been injured on the battle in, in uh, anywhere in the battle, it mostly came from London, from the, where they were stationed when the, bombs fell. Well, that's where the bombs were directed. They weren't directed at us. They didn't know. It was just that we got the aftermath of, of the German bombers when they came over and tried London and then came around by us and dropped them there. And so, so they actually surgical. did drop on the Red Cross area? No, well, one of them did, but that one I'll tell you about that. It was a, it was during the day and uh, so that it had been, often it had been a floater. I mean, no, who would have thought they didn't bomb in the daytime? And so it landed in a huge coal pile behind the enlisted men's nut, a hut. And then there were 33 men in that hut asleep for the day because they had to duty at night. And they, uh, they, fell, poor thing, they fell out of bed. It shook everything. It shook the Red Cross building badly. So the window behind me where I was typing and doing my 
work of, of handing out razors and toothpaste and combs and getting stamps for the, the patients and writing up accounts for the, where I was there and writing, it was my little home, and I fortunately had the window open because I liked, I liked fresh air. Everybody else had their windows closed. And that's why I didn't get shattered with, with um, you know, broken glass. But I went out into the craft room and there was a delightful black soldier called Willie and he was lying on the floor. He had, a, he had a, a, some sort of a cast on. These were mostly surgical patients, broken bones, broken all collarbones, some of them, and all of this that were injured in the battle and in the bombing and then many medical wounds. And so we were separated into medical and surgical people, the doctors. But, but this little, little fellow, so I said, Willie, what happened to you? And he said, something done blow the chair right out from under me. Yeah. He was crawling to the door. There was another man who was in a body, cold body cast and I thought he was dead. I just, he was, didn't move. So I rushed to the nearest ward where the young doctor was struggling with all the surgical para patients who were up in, they were taught, you know, they were strung up on their, on their various ways to keep their bones straight. And none of them could move. Of course, they were frantic. And he was frantic with them. And I insisted to him that he had to come because somebody had died in my Red Cross. So with great reluctance, he didn't want to leave his men, his patients. So he came and there was nobody on the floor. It had been that the wind had been completely knocked out of him. And when he came to, he got up and walked outside. So for the rest of my time in the army, in the, in the, with the hospital, this man never let me forget, this doctor never let me forget that at all. The man you thought so, was dead and then he yeah, disappeared. But there were many purple hearts and people where they rebuilt the men's huts. And we, they lived in, the enlisted men lived in tents during that time, but that was, so we had, and we'd go into London and um, we could do that. And then well, I got caught there one night and, and had gone to a theater or something and decided that I, I would stay overnight in a hotel. It seemed the only thing to do. So I was by myself in a hotel that I didn't know, and they had an air raid, and the, the manager of the hotel came and knocked on my door, and he said, you know, it's time to go down to the air raid shelter. And I said, no, no, I don't plan to. And he said, what do you mean you don't plan to? I said, well, I've decided I might as well die here as to go down to the air raid shelter. So I, he said, well, that's on your own then. I said, fine. So we didn't get, <laughs> we didn't get a bomb on the hotel, but, but I probably was pretty foolish not to do that. Now at this point you're a young 20-something, correct? Mm -hmm. and, and, and saying that you might as well die there, but were you afraid or you, you, you no, say I all was, of this so I just, calmly, but... No, but I was just, I know, I didn't seem to get panicky about that. And I said jokingly, I'm just a die. I, it was not a joke, but it was the fact that I, I didn't uh, want to go down out on the streets and a, and a strange go down in there, and I figured that I'd take my chances, you know. I really decided that when you're there long enough and you know that everybody goes down the raid and most people don't get hit where they were, it's just like anything else. How, how often would you get hit by light when well, you know the same thing? So I just decided I wouldn't go down there. Afterwards, I thought people... And we went in and we came back out from London when there was a big air raid going on, and the whole of the first general were at the gates. They knew we were out and we bicycled in and they kept yelling, get in here and get your steel helmets. I got called, you know, we got called and said, why didn't you carry your steel helmets? Well, we weren't about, we had to carry gas masks and steel helmets any place we went. And did you ever have to use your gas mask? Mm -hmm. Did you ever have to use? No, nope, no, nope. I was naughty because, I was not very, because when I went someplace on a short trip, I didn't want to carry a big bag. We didn't have bags to carry particularly, duffel bag was too big. So I would put my overnight clothes in my gas mask instead in my gas mask carrier instead of the gas mask. So and how long did you stay in the London area? We were there ten months. And then we moved uh, we were told that we had to move to thought we were moving to France. But before that June D Day came along and I had asked for a leave for the first time in a year. And so they said, fine, and I was going to Scotland on leave, and that morning when I woke up and got out at very early, there were a lot of planes going over that were pulling gliders that had stripes on them. And we had been waiting for D-Day. We never knew when it was going to happen. And so uh, the colonel, our colonel was not up yet. And so I had said, oh, I said, I better not go. And my field 
director, B. Garrett, an older woman, I mean older by 10 years, uh, said to me, absolutely, you go. Get out of here before Colonel Albright gets up and calls all leaves out. So I did. And on the way up to Scotland, nobody knew for sure whether it was actually D-Day. We'd stop off and get tea at different stations and nobody knew. But it was D-Day. And uh, as I said, what could I have done at that particular moment? I got back in time to get the injured from you know, into, and we visited then. I had visited 60 patients a day just talking, because I had to do everything besides just the secretary. We all had to do everything that we were to So do. tell us about a typical day. What time would you normally get up? Oh, I only got up about, I would say it would be 6.30 or 7, and then had our breakfast, and then went to the office of, and went into the Red Cross building. So you did some secretarial work, but then you also visited with some of the Oh, yes, whenever soldiers. they were, that's right. And if we had, for example, at all the holidays, we made presents. We, had, we gave dances to the, for the enlisted men to the Women's Land Army. And uh, so we made, I don't know how much, cocoa and sandwiches. And, you know, I kept saying that I was going to go into the catering business when I got home. <laughs> you were so used but, to but, making these. But we had, a, I have a typical day here. Um, I might add, for those wondering what you're looking at, why don't you show the front cover of that? This is the memoirs that you did, and initially they were for your family, but you have also given them to your schools right. and to this library also. So it's That's right. I, my husband had every, my three sons and four grandsons were fascinated by the, my husband's experiences, who really had <clears throat> quite a time, and he stayed afterwards in the Army of Occupation. And uh, so he, I decided that they ought to know about their grandmother. So I wrote and I said it, I dedicated it to my four grandsons with the thought that they might be interested in a glimpse into the past of their grandmother when she was young and adventuresome. That's what I had written. So I sat down and did it. And <clears throat> I, I, it is not written about what I remember from now. It is written from letters I sent home to my mother who kept every single letter. And she saved them, and I couldn't tell her numbers or patients or things like that. So she thought I was having a social life, and what a good, wonderful time I was having. Why didn't I just come home? You know, that sort of thing. So I kept trying to tell her. I couldn't tell her all of the things I might have been able to tell her. But much later, after my husband died, 50, 60 years later, 50 years later, I discovered a journal that I'd forgotten completely about at the bottom of an old um, blanket box that we'd put everything in, just out of my memory. And so I had started this whole thing from just the letters and triggering my mind. Then I was able to quote the journal. So I wrote... So it was in, your journal that you yeah, kept while you were over there? That's right. And so what I did was went back and wrote it chrono chronologically, injecting what I'd said in a letter, which was different, what I'd written in the journal about what actually happened that I couldn't write about. And, and the reason you couldn't write was for security reasons? Mm -hmm. They just, did they oh, give you a little prep course on that to tell you what you could or couldn't Oh yes, write? they did, but if you slipped it all, and then you wrote V-mail mostly, you know, the, not, the, not the regular mail, V-mail, they would cut it out or block it out completely. And V-mail, explain that for those who may not understand what V-mail was. Well, I'm not quite sure, but you wrote it on a smaller piece of paper. It's just like we weren't very advanced in technology, and it was just like our faxing something and sending it. It went through somehow as a, 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 they copied it, and you, you wrote it on a piece of very small, very small piece of paper. paper. And then they would and send it And on. they would send that, yeah. But mostly I wrote longer letters home because it was kind of foolish except to let them know that you were okay and you mm -hmm. did that sort of thing. So that was that. So after Scotland and you found out it was D-Day, yep. was your tour over or did you go from there? Oh, no, no. Then we stayed on all summer long and we were there until it was about October that we were going to go to, um, we went down to uh, Southampton in October the 3rd, 1944, and we, did, we went, up, well, we went before that, actually, because we had uh, some long time on the sea. What we did was we were told we had to go to, over to France, and so we were, went down to Southampton to embark from there, and uh, we finally got on, if you wait just a minute, because if you want to know the names of the ships we got on, um, so we were down there through a few days in, in 
September, in uh, late September in uh, Southampton. And then we uh, went off to, um, can't find that name of it. It's not too bad. I have it somewhere, but I didn't. I'll maybe think of it. But it was a well, no, the Prince of Wales. That's what it was. It was a, a, cru a recreation cruise ship for England, but they had to get all the ships in, and it was a very short trip. It was 24 hours basically. Uh, it was about that. But the sea was so rough, and the people were getting seasick, and the food was in short supply. They thought they'd have to take us back. So suddenly they decided they couldn't take us back and wouldn't because we were needed over there. So it was a very rugged crossing. Do you remember getting sick or were you oh, okay? I didn't, no, I didn't get sick, but I do remember very clearly. how uh, I remember we didn't have much food, but it didn't matter too much. No, I didn't get sick at all, but people did. And the way they got our duffel bags where all our possessions were in was to toss them. From, what they decided to do was get us out of there on an LC which was a Navy landing vessel with a flat, a little front pilot house and a engines and so forth and a big flat, like a, your, you know, surface uh, just flat to the ocean where people stood when they were transferred into the, from a major boat into the land and that's how they did it in Omaha Beach with the soldiers. So they brought one of those and they decided that they would have nets that would come down from the side and the enlisted men would crawl down those nets they would first of all toss all of our 655 duffel bags with all our personnel down onto the, onto the deck. How the deck was moving, the Prince of Wales was moving, and I would say we counted at least 25 bags that landed in the bottom of the ocean, I mean of the channel. We were crossing the channel. And everybody there thought it was theirs, you know how you do oh. But anyway, then we got those down, and we got the men down and landed, and then we got, because we couldn't all get on it, well I guess we pretty well all got on that huge, LS, LCT. <coughs> and then they decided that how would they get the women down? So they decided they put a huge canvas chute, green canvas chute, from the top deck of the Prince of Wales down to the deck below, secured by two or three Navy guys holding on to it, supposedly. They were really holding on to it. And then what we did is that who was to go first? Well, as usual, in the women's group, the men, the officers had to go down the sides. The, the nurses always went first when it was something very good, like a bonus or some extra wine or whatever they gave us as bonus. And the nurses always went, I mean the Red Cross always went first when it was something that nobody else wanted to a do. A little danger, <coughs> and how do you, the Red Cross. <laughs> and how do you find out which Red Cross is uh, going to go first? Well, you do it alphabetically. Well, I was alphabetically first. I was also the tallest and biggest, and they thought it was a good trial. But they first sent down a dog. Somebody had brought a dog on board without anybody knowing, so they sent the dog down. And the Navy guys, were knowing women were coming down, decided, so they let the dog slide all the way across and just caught it. And we thought, oh my goodness, is it that slippery down here? <coughs> so anyway, I put all the stuff from my pistol belt on my lap, now, you call it a pistol belt. Well, you didn't have a pistol, though. No, 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 okay. but, they, but the other, they did for the matter. Right. Yeah. So, okay. web with all your extra little things clipped onto it. Sure. I thought it might cut through the canvas. So, I slid down, and, and the, the, the Navy men, just as I kind of expected, let me slide quite a bit, but they did stop me, and everybody applauded. And because I seemed to be such a good sport about it, it was raining, absolutely terribly raining. And so, they took me up to the pilot house, and I got candy and gum and coffee, and everybody else stood in the rain for the time to get onto the beachhead. Now, when you talk about the beachhead, was this Omaha Beach? Yes, this was Omaha Beach. And, and how, f how long after the invasion did you land? Well, this was, we landed on, uh, and we took a crossing on, on October 7th. So we landed somewhere <coughs> two or three two days after that. And then we were, it was the same beachhead because we then had to climb the hill where the Germans had shot all our Americans as they tried to climb up the hill. And it wasn't an easy climb and I can tell you that we, we thought how, how, how much we respected the, those fighting men who'd cleared the way for us by climbing that hill. Then we got into trucks. The enlisted men hiked 
five miles through the mud. It was a muddy, muddy place. And then we finally rode in trucks, and that's when we saw the most devastation ever because they were, that place had been shot up. And there are houses with just mirrors hanging and pictures and frames and nothing left but a wall. Were the villagers there still? Yep, many of them. Did you talk to any of them? Mm -hmm. Did they greet you as you went through? <coughs> many of them were um, reasonably friendly. A couple of them were quite friendly. And I talked to one woman who, when we found a chicken, we got a chicken. I somehow got a chicken and she agreed and then cleaned it and she agreed to cook it for us in one of the houses nearby. And uh, I asked her if she did this because she felt it was a duty to the Americans who were there and felt she was intimidated and had to, or whether she said, no, I had to under the Germans, but I'm doing this because I want to. There was so, that But there in some towns where Carrington and so forth, you can understand, they were not terribly friendly. They'd been absolutely destroyed by American bombing too. But on the whole, they were, generally very happy to have us there. I mean, so you arrived at Normandy Beach, went into trucks, and where were you going? Well, there? we went about, I think it was almost, uh, maybe was it about, we rode 40 miles and we went to a little town called Mare de Glis, de Glis, which was in the news sometime for some parachute, parachute trooper that had landed in the steeple at some point. So we went there and we landed in a huge mud field where there were tents. And uh, there were, uh, they were all set in, ready set up, and then we raised more. And we were still eating K-rations, which are pretty, pretty dull. It rained all night. Tell us about K-rations. Well, what I can remember, if I, I don't care to remember too much, there was, you know, a little dried up meat of some sort in a little tin. And there was, um, uh, I know there was always a, a, a bar of something sweet like you'd put our granola bars together now. But there wasn't much else. I mean, it was just enough to keep you going and, and supposedly give you enough protein, and that was day and night because we had no fires. We finally, I, uh, so the Red Cross would tear down. There was a big, we had tents and it was in an apple orchard. So the latrines were all in the apple orchard. And when we went out to the latrines, we had to wear our steel helmets because the apples were dropping at that time of year. It was in October. And so, and the app, some of the apple trees were died off and so forth. So I can remember that we tore a few limbs off them and tried to get a fire going to make some coffee because there wasn't anything hot most of the time when we were there. So anyway, that, that went on for some time and we were really in, in the mud for uh, oh, maybe 17, 18 days. The engineers on the, who, had, who were stationed in the, in the side of the hills over Omaha Beach heard that the Red Cross was there and somebody somehow got us a chance because we never had any showers. So we had two canteens of water a day and three strips of toilet paper. That was it. That was it. And uh, so we did all we could. That's when we got into little units. The Red Cross protected themselves, the nurses scrounged where they could. And so the Red Cross got a chance to go off and have a shower at the officers um, at the officers in the engineer group that was stationed nearby on the, well, quite a few miles. So they came and got us and we had showers and they posted officers so that we could have showers. And it was wonderful because we'd had five or six days without it. And so then afterwards, what we had to pay for it was to have dinner with them in an old farmhouse and stay into the evening before they took us home. And we had a charming Red Cross gal from Texas with a wonderful accent and just charming. And every time they sang, the eyes of Texas are on you, she stood up, you know, and they got her going. So after uh, quite a bit of wine flowed, they <laughs> really had her jumping up and down most of the time. But then they took us back, and that was fine. And then, the, finally, the commandant, uh, Colonel Albright, got us a chance to have them set up a whole tent for the nurses to shower, because by that time, it was seven, eight, ten days, and they hadn't showered at all. So they got us into trucks. And we decided we could wash our clothes then, so we were fine. We got over there. We undressed hurriedly in the front of this huge tent, which had pipes. The engineers had set up pipes all the way around it where the water spread, spurred out from it, you know, so it was kind of a... And we had 55 nurses and of all sizes. And they, 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 we got our clothes off, and we were all going to get a little, one of the little whole faucets to get our clothes washed. So 
it was like the hot water was steaming through. It looks like it was kind of like an opium smoker's dream. <laughs> Fifty-five assorted naked women <laughs> running through, running through the tent, and washing their clothes and slipping, you know, and sliding on that. So you, you didn't care. You didn't care as long as you didn't slip in the mud. So it was only after we all got out of there and got this that we discovered that the engineers had made peepholes all the way around the tent. So, so we, they uh, had a, a nice show, huh? Yeah, they just they did. Anyway, we finally got out of there, and uh, we're headed towards France, I mean, towards Paris. You see, what we were waiting for was them to really secure Paris so we could have the first American hospital have a general hospital in Paris for those being killed off in the Siegfried Line and so where they're injured and that sort of thing. And were you made aware daily or about what was happening in France and Germany? Very little news. That was one. They knew more at home what was going on and uh, than we did. We just were told when we would move and what had happened. We knew when they told us they'd moved to Paris that they'd gotten all the Germans, except for the women, German mice they were called, the women, the gray, the gray mice. They were still in the subways for some reason. They stayed back and I don't know why, but when we went there, we, we had curfews so that we wouldn't you know, be endangered by some of them because it was still pretty rough. So the were the German women similar to the American waves? Probably. American wax, more likely. American wax, and they were called? Well, we caught, they were called because they were more vicious in many ways. They were not what I would compare with the wax and the way their attitude was. But, and I don't know much about them because we didn't get too involved, you know, with them. And mostly it was the German soldiers who were fighting our soldiers that we heard much more about. But the only time I heard about the gray mice was when we came to, to Paris. Whereas the SS troops and the Germans had retreated from Paris and uh, they had blown up. We were supposed to go into a huge comp compound of buildings that would have been built for the orphans of the First World War by Leon Bloom. And we were prepared to go there and uh, we got there and just after we got to Paris, they, the SS, before they left, blew up a huge ammunition dump and it broke every single window in all of those brick, substantial buildings. So we waited more time in Paris in a hotel where they had us quartered, and uh, no heat, no hot water, and no food of any kind that we could really eat. So it wasn't a pleasant stay in Paris, but we were waiting. And just as everything got ready for us, there were a group of French children playing, and they got into a train that was abandoned on, abandoned on a track where there were a lot of ammunition, and they triggered that. And it blew them, plus all the windows, not all the windows, but some of them out again. So it was quite, quite an experience. Now, how, how close were you to that when that happened? Oh, well, we, were, we were stationed in Paris. This was in Ville Juif, which must have been, oh, 10, 10 miles outside of Paris. But you heard about this? Oh, we didn't hear it, but just as we thought we were going to move, somebody would come back and report. We couldn't do it, and that's why. So we, you didn't get communications to, of everything exactly as it happened, you know, you couldn't, but you got enough to know you, when you could move. But everything was tentative. I mean, you had to be so flexible if you worried about what was going to do tomorrow. And this is why I think my memoirs are more interesting in a way, is because it was all, I didn't know the day I wrote that and the way I'm writing it, what would happen the next day. So it wasn't that I was reflecting back on it. It was what I wrote the day before I knew what would happen the next day, what would happen. So you had to really not be the worried kind. You had to also be, I got into so much multitasking. I was just called in on all sides to do everything. For, and if you sort of gave up and said, I can't do it until I give it some more thought, you never could have gotten through the but day. It wasn't time to do that. Oh, no. You just were busy all the time. And that the night I got into Paris and to the hotel, we all leapt on the beds and we dashed into bathrooms. We took terribly cold ba baths and we didn't care. It was just wonderful. And then I got a call from the Red Cross headquarters that had gotten established in Paris just before we got there. And they said, your brother is in the 40th General Hospital, which had just arrived also. Well, I, I, and they said they don't know how long they'll keep him because he'll be airlifted back to England. And then I knew he was wounded. Yep, yeah, is wounded in a pain. And I then knew that 
he, if he were going to be airlifted back to England, and from my experience with the hospitals, that meant that he was really going, he was quite seriously wounded or couldn't get back to the battlefront or they wouldn't have done that. So I had no idea, having seen patients in our place without eyes, without limbs, without that. So I, I, they said, you'd better come if you can because we don't know how long we'll keep him. You know, they don't know, they just drift him out. So I got a sergeant friend of mine. We had a curfew. It was our first night in. He didn't know where the first general was either in Paris. I mean, the 40th general. So he came, and I thought afterwards, I could have had him court-martialed. What was I doing asking him to take me after curfews through the dark streets of, to another hospital? So now, uh, by taking you, were you in a jeep? Were you walking? No, he was in a, he was in a, yeah, he was in a what do they call it? A, not a jeep. It was kind of a jeep. It was a something carrier. Um, anyway, I've got, it's a, it was an open kind of a car mm -hmm. that, you know, that they used to wheel around in. And so he, and he had permission, he was one of the men who drove those. So he came up and as we got, we finally found our way. I'm not quite sure how we did it because it was the other side of Paris. But anyway, we were there and as we came up there, he said, I don't think we better go to the front door. He said, let me go to find a side door. And uh, you go in and I'll sit here. But he said, don't stay too long. I don't know whether we'll be caught or not. So I went in and found, I had my Red Cross uniform on. And uh, so I went in and, and just wandered down the corridor asking where the officer's ward was because I decided I wasn't going to identify. But in, on the way, I decided I was not going to break down no matter what he had. I was not going to let myself carry on. Now was he older than you? Fifteen months younger. Younger then. than you. And was he in the army? Yes, he was in the army. Okay. He'd, he'd been in the Tenth Mountain Air. He'd been in a lot of things. But he was then in the army. And so I got to the edge of the, of the officer's ward just to turn with it. I looked in and there he was on the first bed on the left. He was sitting up in bed. He had champagne. He had a, a a leg cast on from there all the way up, so I knew his limb was still there. Nothing else seemed apparent. That it, and he was entertaining the ward with chitty chat. He had perfume that somebody had bought him so he could give to a nurse or something, you know, just general Mr. Congeniality. And so I looked at him and I said, when I walked around, he didn't know whether I was coming or not. So I walked and I said to him, well, is that all that's wrong with you? That was my first words. And he looked up, and an officer leaning down on the another patient bed leaned up on his elbow, and he said, is this a sister you've been telling about? And Jack said, yes. He said, well, all I can say is she's mighty cold-blooded, this officer said. And that was when I was just, I, you know. And it, my brother said, the Crawfords are all cold-blooded, and that's the way we like them. So that was fine. So the colonel was so excited that he had a patient who had a sister, and Paris, and he said, this fellow, is he's not going to get back the front again. He's got to have an operation. It's gone through his ankles and his Achilles tail, and he's got a mess on his foot. But he said, it, it, it can wait. It's nothing that's going to be damaged. And he said, I think it's so interesting. And I hadn't seen him for 22 months. And so he kept him. He said, one day you'll have come out here, and I, I can't get in touch with him. He will have been sent. Back uh, to England. Yeah, so six days in a row I came out on the subway. And one day I was so tired, it was so hot, I sort of fainted. So I was in the subway and people I came to and they got me to the hos into the hospital. So when the next, that day when I came down to see him, I was in an army, army pajamas and a bathrobe to visit him. And it wasn't the same fellow, but another one said, my goodness, your sister will do anything to get to see you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, one day I came, seven days later, and he'd been airlifted out. Been airlifted out. But he came along fine. It was now all right. when you mentioned your uniform, um, I have visions of white and a navy cape. Is that what you wore? Oh, no, 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 no. Fatigue we, still? We, well, no, we had, we had a uniform which had gray, very Air, Air Force blue, very nice. It was cut. We, were, we got our uniforms about the, a week after we got into our hospital in North Mims. We were sent into London to the headquarters. And the top tailors in, in, uh, in England, in London, Measured us, gave us custom belt, Air Force blue jackets and, and trousers, a couple of pairs, and a big coat of Air Force blue, heavy coat for the winter. And they did all that. Then we wore during the day, and in warmer weather, we wore gray seersucker dresses, or skirt and top of gray seersucker. That's what we wore, mostly with an emblem on it.
So when you win, you place the dress in your, you know, in your, your uniform, yeah, yeah, whatever right. it might be. Yeah, right. So how long did you stay in, in the Paris area? Before we got into our hospital, I mean, or uh, and when we, well, the total thing was we moved, we came over in late October and finally got into our hospital um, November something. I mean, we were in Paris longer than we thought, four weeks, and then went to our hospital, and we were there from no from November through to the next September. Uh, so then the war ended in May '45, but we stayed on. And they tried to decide whether we'd go to the Pacific or where we would be, or whether we'd get home or where. So that I finally got back to the States in the early November of 1945. So I was all together six months in the United States in training, 10 months in England, and 12 months in France. Pretty much. That's and did you come home by ship as you had gone oh, over? Oh, yes. We, it was a ship that that was an adventure. We were in the staging ground for, we went sent to what they call one of these Philip, Camp Philip Morris, which was near Reims in, in France, and staging to get ready to go. And as they, the units were, they found ships available, then we would, we would be given the ships to go over so that we, we spent the, about four to five weeks in the staging area and finally, finally got home. But, uh, the ship we were on was, let us see what it was. It was a, oh, it was a sister ship to the Morro Castle. Remember that burned, that small, that it was a ship that had never been anywhere but between United States and, and Nova Scotia and the United States and the Caribbean. It had never gone on the high seas, but they commandeered all that. So it was a very small ship, comparatively speaking, and it was, it was really a terribly rough coming back in November. And everybody was seasick then. But what happened is our wonderful colonel, we had three of the Red Cross were the same that had been in with us all the time. The others had got sent to other units. And uh, so a lot of the people changed just towards the end when we were getting ready to go home. They were bringing in new Red Cross workers, new nurses, and then we were going home as a unit because Colonel Albright was determined that he'd do that. So he, of course, considered us. We'd been with him for all these months. So he got to the docks, and the captain of the ship said, he got through all the men, the enlisted men, the officers, Colonel Albright stood on the docks waiting until the last person was on. He got to us, three of us, and he said to Colonel Albright, noticing that we were Red Cross, I'm sorry, I don't have any room. And we had waited all that time. I could have gone home as a casual and taken my chance, but I was, so Colonel Albright, who was rather a small man and rather, you know, short, and I was probably taller than he was, stood up to him and he said, if you don't have room for these three Red Cross who've been with us all the way through, then I will march every single person off this ship, 600 of them. And the captain said, okay. <laughs> but what room they found us was in the infirmary's medical office where the sergeant had to do all his duty. And they put, they had two bunks in there and then we had a mattress on the floor and he came in every day to do his work because there's no other place. And he'd always knock and say, are you all decent? You know, and, they would, and we rotated for 10 days who slept on the floor and who slept in oh the bunks because, because it wasn't fair not to. But so many people got seasick. It was dreadful. And the enlisted men were just, you know, sitting around. You couldn't get out on deck to get air. And so it wasn't a very, but we didn't care about all that. We were going home. Going, and where did you arrive when you came home? Well, we arrived in, in Boston, but we were immediately sent to, uh, my, nobody could come to see us. We were immediately sent to Washington to sort of head to, uh, you know, check in or check out of the Red Cross officially. So we didn't get home until about, I would say Thanksgiving by the time we went Thanksgiving of 45. Yes, we had got we docked in early, oh, mid, after my birthday sometime, 11, 12, someplace, but we spent a couple of weeks. And when you went to Washington, were you actually then discharged from the yep, Red Cross yep, at that yep. point? And you had mentioned prior to coming on camera that had you been um, captured, you in fact would have been what rank? A captain, because a captain. we were considered, we were going to be considered along with the nurses who were all well, they were all lieutenants in various places, but they all had their ranking as officers. 
But they gave the Red Cross the rank of, I don't know why, but they just picked the rank of captain that they designated so that the Germans who captured us. For example, we had many Germans on our, <coughs> that we had captured that were on our compound, our big hospital unit outside of Paris, and they lived in a huge tent. And when the Battle of the Bulge happened, which was one of the worst times for the American armies because everybody got pushed back almost to Paris. And so we, by that time, had a good group of German prisoners. And so when Paris thought it was going to be bombed again, we lit up, I mean, we, I didn't, but our, our commander lit up the German prisoner area, but not the rest of us. Well, we were like between here and the town hall from the tents, and we all thought, well, that was pretty foolish. How could we count on the Germans being that, that accurate? But that's what they did. So the German war prisoners were really very happy to be captured and be there because they got good food and good everything. But they were, in a way, kind of insolent. They got so used to our treating them reasonably well. And we had, I had to be on duty at the air evacuation building three times, a, three nights a week to talk to all of the patients on stretchers until they got ready to be taken off to the airfield, airport and keep them, talk with them and hand them coffee and, you know, just chatter with them. And the Germans were supposed to be there ready to carry them. And when the head colonel came in and he found that the Germans were smoking and chitty chatting and not standing around having a heck of a good time, he lost his cool because he said he'd visited the war prisoners and our prisoners in the German camps. And he yelled at them to stand at attention, you know, they couldn't smoke, they had to stand, he kept them standing attention and saying to them what he found in their territory and when they'd gone over there. So they, they had, an, and you know, I was behind one when he went by and he wanted to light up a cigarette. He was walking over to some duty and he had, and he went into where they had the, the, one of the fire places that heat the, heat the, where the heat establishment, and put a broom into something that lit it on fire and came out and used a perfectly good broom to light his cigarette. And that made me so mad, you know, I went up and <laughs> gave him a piece of my mind. Now, this was a German prisoner who did this? Yep. And did he understand you? Oh, sure. He knew exactly what, you know, body language about what are you using the broom for to light up your cigarette, you know. I mean, that, he didn't understand, but he knew. So they were prisoners, but they had... Oh, they duties. They did all the heavy work. The men, the men did the enlisted ward duty and helped with the, all the non-medical aspects of the, oh, and many of them with the medical aspects too, completely. But once we got German prisoners in there, did a lot of the heavy work of shoveling and sweeping. We had heavy snows in the winter, very heavy. And uh, so it was cold and we, we had, you know, so that, uh, but when the German, when the Americans came in from the battlefront, they were always still in bandages. They had gone through a field hospital briefly. They were brought immediately to our hospital and as they were taken out, the nurses were trying very hard to clean them up, get the doctors in there to see the wounds. And the German prisoners unloaded those ambulances because other men were all busy with other things. So it got so that the patients wounded came to, saw a German prisoner carrying them in and thought they were, well, it didn't occur to anybody that that's what happened until they did. They thought they were captured. Yeah, so than... the, the colonel sent me down to, to talk to them and to say immediately as each one was unloaded, where they were and that they were our prisoners and we were in a safe place. So the courage of those men was unbelievable and the humor of the American soldier under difficulty is like nobody else's. Well, that's another question. Do you have any ca characters or humorous experiences that kind of stand out or touching experiences that kind of stand yeah, out in your mind? There are a few. And this one was particularly so because that's what I would lean over and some of them you could they didn't have wounds on their heads. And I can, but one man was just shivering and so frightened, this young man, soldier. And I leaned over and told him where he was. I said, so having gone from being shivering and upset when he heard they were our prisoners, he immediately sat up and said, let the dogs carry me in. Mm -hmm. And another one was so bandaged, that I didn't know whether he was alive almost. He had his eyes and a hole for his mouth. So I leaned over and like you do, you don't know what to say. But I explained it. What, where they were, but then I said, is there anything I can do for you? Which, foolish, and he said, this deep voice came out, he said, not unless you want to change places with me, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was really touching. And then I got, I got to know some of them quite well who were 
there was a Polish paratrooper from Poland originally, and he had been hit by a taxi cab in London on his leave. And he, he was brought to our hospital, and so he was there, and he was a very interesting fellow, and he talked to me a lot about it, and I think he got he married an English girl, and she was going to have a baby, so he brought her to the hospital, and she, uh, none of the men had ever done obstetrics except in their training. And they, they tried to draw, draw straws of who would deliver this child. And they tried to look it up in a book to be sure they knew because they had been dealing with others. But he worked in the craft shop and he made me a ring that I still have today that was made out of a U.S. quarter and an and a, and a English dime. And they were both of them, you know. And he formed and did did that to me. So I remember lots of the lots of the of the soldiers and uh, patients, you know, that way. The one at the dance and the the post office band came and we had a dance for the bed patients who could walk around. I mean, the ambulatory patients who were just perfectly okay to walk around and go to a dance. And this very nice um, black soldier from Texas came. And he, well, he, there was a jitterbug dance on, and they didn't have enough girls. They were, just didn't have, so the Red Cross were danced off their feet. And so he went up to this, this sweet little gal from Texas, not knowing who she was, and asked her if she'd danced. And she'd never danced with a black person. This was back before, you remember, in 1943, when everything was segregated. Segregated, sure. And so she said no as nicely as she could. <clears throat> and he came over to me. He was much shorter than I was. And he said, when I dance, and I said to him, I'd love to, but I, this is not the kind of a dance I can possibly do. A jitter dog is not for me. But I said, you find a waltz and come back. So he came back, and I danced a waltz with him. And he said, uh, ma'am, you sure got the rhythm for this. And so we had a good dance. <clears throat> then I asked him how he thought the music was. I said, isn't this a great band? And he said, you know what I like about him best? They's all musically inclined. <laughs> so, so he was quite. So we had a lot of friends. I knew the janitor and the housemaid there that we kept on, who washed our underwear and polished our shoes, and and the jan janitor who never knew a word of English when I needed a can opener. You, I can still see him going down the corridor saying, "Can opener, can opener," <laughs> so he wouldn't forget it. You already got to the kitchen, but so you know, you just got to be. They were your family. I mean. And that was why it was hard coming back. Nobody back here really realized they couldn't. They had gone through their own experiences, and they were had food shortages and all kinds of problems. And we, ended, but they couldn't understand us really. And the German, the American soldiers were really worried about what would happen to them when they got back and out of the army. And they, they were kind of arrogant about it, but they were scared underneath about what would happen. So I had a great. I spent a lot of time talking to our enlisted men and the patients about, you know, we'd been lectured on this and the social worker talked to us and we all talked to them about what to experience. And you know, what happened to me is I talked that to everybody else and when I got home I hadn't really told myself enough about you it. You had so been it was telling very tough. them but not realizing very yourself tough, what very it would tough, be like yeah. for you. And I had gotten engaged to a sergeant over there. And then that all fell apart when I got home, which wasn't too great. But so the whole combination was, that was about the lowest period of my life when I got back from all of that. And what but was it like for your mom having you back? Hmm? What was it like for your mother having you back? Well, she in the meantime was, she had no, the other thing is I came back to no home. Because she had had to rent the house to keep going and she was a house mother at Katie Gibbs. And so she had no place. So I had to rent a room on Beacon Street I couldn't afford. And eat out and uh, until I got a job of some sort. So it wasn't easy at all. And my brother came home and was nine months in the hospital. And it wasn't easy for him either. Then my mother got back to the house and, and sort of worked out of that but, uh, so that we were able to start to work out of that. But anyway, it, that's a long tale afterwards. But you know, it all came out all right. And what did you do when you got home? Did you, you well, I couldn't. You had to get I, a job? I couldn't. Uh, I decided that I had to stick with the medical, so I became a senior editorial secretary to the surgical staff at Peter Bent Brigham, and they were supposed to write all their papers, and I was supposed to edit them and get them ready for publishing. And uh, but nobody had time, and I worked for Elliot Cutler, who was the top of the surgical division, a marvelous man who had developed cancer during the war when he was in England, and he was dying. 
So what he, what he did was dictate to me the, his experiences every day to give me something to do. And so that was not a, that was grim too, on top of living in a, you know, so it wasn't a happy experience. And then I went back to see my old president of Wellesley, had come back to be president of Wellesley, and I had known her very well as a student, and um, she, she talked to me about a job in personnel, which is personnel director that they were having a new office start where they would have a chance to hire and fire everybody up to the faculty, and they decided, she, she said, of course, I can't get you the job. If you interview these five heads of departments and prove yourself to them, then you could, you'll probably get it. I said, I can't do that. I'm, I'm, and not, I've not had it. And she said, Mary Ellen, you know, I knew you was a student. I also know what you've got, you know, I know what you've been doing since. And she said, you can do it. And she said, uh, I said, well, I think I ought to go back to school and get another degree. She said, two ways to get somewhere. One is to go back and get your credentials. The other is to use your experience. And you'll have to go all the way back after your credentials to start up the path of experience again. So she was my mentor my whole life, whatever I did. Uh, so did you get the job? Yes, I did. Were partly, you partly I got it because the unions were coming in. And there were three of the five I interviewed, the head of the kitchens, the head of the physical plant, the head of uh, the, the, all of the heads of house and so forth. And each of them had a private theory about a union. They either liked it or not. And I've never been able to be anything but outspoken and honest. I can't, I don't, I can't seem to fudge enough to, to cover it up because I can't remember, you know. So I just said honestly, I do not know anything about unions except I learned in a social class in college. And I said, so I have no opinion. So each of them thought, aha, oh, you know, so they, and then we had a big union fight, a huge union fight with the college. So that's where I started. And then I did that for 10 years. I did get eight years, got married to somebody who had been through the hospital when he was a patient, but I never knew him. Isn't and my ironic? best friend who was Red Cross married his best buddy. And then when I, at their wedding, she insisted I meet George, et cetera. So at that time, I was, I was not interested. I was going to have a career, you know, forget it. Anyway, we got married. I had three boys and then went back. President, President Clapp came back to get me the next thing. And so then I became director of admission at Wellesley for 16, 17 years. And George, of course, was wonderful because I traveled. I had, you know, and these three boys learned how to cook meals and wash their own clothes. So and they became very They've got wonderful wives. Their wives are very lucky people because they, <laughs> they do all of that, too. Now, coming back, I notice you have a pin on you. Is that your Wellesley pin? Oh, yes. It's, I don't, I forgot to take it off on this side because I was a bit hurry. Where is, oh, yes, here. Uh, because, well, I, I, I belong to lots of committees and volunteer work and all around. I just am the kind, having had multitasking, I'm, can't, I'm not quite content until I'm doing seven different ways. As my mother said, you always chew off, bite up more than you can chew. But I, I got on the, um, I was always an athlete in my early days, and I, I was in the Athera Academy Sports Hall of Fame in my high school. Anyway, so at, at school, I had been an athlete. It's not anything great. But when they formed a, a Friends of Athletics, they got me to be on the committee. So when I retired from it, they gave me this little pin about athletics. Now, I might remind those watching, um, your next birthday celebration, you will be 90 years old. That's right. You're such a spunky lady. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I've got uh, two hip replacements, a very bad back, but I go to the pool at Wellesley twice a week. It's the only thing that saves my joints because so I can't walk any great distances. But so in the you water, still stay, stay in, active. In the water again. As we wrap up, um, have you gone back to any reunions with your old group from? We did have Red one. Cross? It was very. We had one down in New York, and it was fascinating to see. But we haven't. But we had a newsletter that the head nurse was wonderful. The men, you know, when the men get back home, they don't excuse me, don't have much, you know, to keep everything together. But the women did. And she found out from each of us, and we, she contributed. So we had a network. And then I wrote to people, my physical therapist, the other, you know. So we retained some of them. But we had a reunion, and I've reunited with a couple of them separately. But we had a first general reunion in New York City <clears throat> at a hotel. And it was fascinating to watch the enlisted men who had been, you know, considered not well, their status, like in any place, the officers considered the enlisted men as necessary, but 
And so it was fascinating to watch some of the enlisted men who became high-powered, wealthy entrepreneurs stag walk around with their big cigars and look at the officers. <laughs> so, you know, well, just who are you now? You know, but it was kind of fun, and it was good to see them all. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. How important do you think serving in the Red Cross during the war was to you, and how do you feel it affected the rest of your life? Gosh, my my grandson wrote, wrote a. a an essay on this for his English class, and it was very hard. He posed that question to me, how did it affect you? Well, as I said, you know, in thinking about it, I think it made a tremendous difference in me. Not, I always liked people. It was important that, to me that people like me. I get my, you know, I really enjoy people very much and need them more than a lot of people do probably. It certainly gave me a broaden my vision so of the kinds of people in this world because the soldiers in our outfit mostly came from Georgia. Couldn't, many of them couldn't read, couldn't write. And we taught them how to write, some of us did that. But it made, and the patients came from all over. And the officers were interesting in the, because I'd always wanted to be a doctor, to see how they had developed and what kind of people they had become. So I think what it did is made me tolerate diversity, not only tolerate, but need it, want it, because nothing, it, uh, now I don't like to be just isolated with one kind of people. And so it broadened my vision that way. I think it developed a tremendous amount of patience in me, although I'm not, I was known as a too quick and too, because the Army way, as I write in this, is just so difficult to live under because nothing is that logical. So if the my, one of my best friends, who was a Greek from a, a Greek soldier from a, a, from a Athens, Georgia, was a very good cook. He ran a first-class restaurant there. What did they make him? A postal clerk when he couldn't really speak English too well. What did they make the cook? Somebody who had been in the postal office. Did they ever change them? No. I mean, so, you know. And then you got so. If an inspector general came to the inspecting general, you just knocked yourself out trying to keep the to get it ready for them, which is fine. And you wanted to do it, and you wanted to be first in their minds. And we had one in which we just worked so hard, and he came through, and he, he went into the kitchen, and he saw a pota potato in the wastebasket, in the garbage, and he picked it out, washed it off, and cut it in half, and gave it to the head chef to, you eat half, and I waste not, want not. And he put up, had us put up signs by, keep your hospital clean by never letting it get dirty. So after he left, everybody put up a sign saying, a patient is just something that somebody that colors up the hospital. You know, because, and then you got into the bureaucracy of when you didn't get anything moved in the way. So you just begin to wonder. And with the accounting system in England, I had to go by the Red Cross in England, and when they gave us their money, and I had to make a monthly accounts, which were so difficult. And I was trained for a week in their, in their office. And as I wrote in here, I can't understand how this, they've ever arrived at where they are. They write in handwriting. This was back in 43 when we were typing accounts and got it's in dusty old books in the archives. It, you know, and I had to account for everything both there. And so I learned a lot about just how other people live. I got to be very good friends with a couple and still kept up with them in the Potter's Bar, and they'd invite us for dinner, and we'd go over, and they'd. And uh, they and were this delighted. Was in London? Yes, I had lot, we had lots of friends. The tea shop uh, owner, I went to see her when she was 80. George and I went over, and I kept up with her for uh, up until 40, 50 years of writing her and uh, keeping up with her son, who was came over as a professor. Finally. So you made international friends. Yeah, that's right, and it was great. And from that, and not just mostly there. And from then on, I craved that kind of experience. So I led a group of girls to, to uh, France, and I led a group of girls to Denmark, and I did everything I could to get back to see this old professor who was taught us French when we were in, in, Fran in France in the hospital. We got him to teach us French. So when you mentioned leading this group of girls, was that from the college? that you would lead over there? Yes, they were you, from, well, not just my college. They were from, they were college age, and they were from all kinds of so colleges. So you would there were do a couple tours, of basically, with them, bring them over? Well, we biked, we lived with families. It's experiment in international living. We lived with families for a while, and then we took the young people and their families on a bicycle trip with us, and we camped throughout. 
So we did that, so we lived in, it was a very interesting situation both, both times. And so I've kept up with those people. I still have a Danish, my Danish mother and grandmother have died, but the, the Danish leader and I and, and her family, all, we all commute, we've been over there and their kids have been over to us. So, and I think the war in a way opened my eyes to what it was like to have different kinds of experiences. Well, Marianne Ames, I want to thank you for coming in today. You've told quite a story and your memory is fantastic and sharing your experiences with us and with those in the future who will watch this is just so rewarding. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you very much.